Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Shafiq, and I would like to welcome all of you in this video session. I hope you guys are doing well. Today, we are going to start a new chapter called uh, Pile Foundation. This chapter will be a little bit bigger in size. That's why I just made like two different parts here. Today, I will just cover part one. You already know that the foundations are primarily divided into two classes like shallow foundation and deep foundation. Shallow foundation when the DF by B means like depth of foundation divided by the width is less than four, then we usually call that one shallow foundation. If DF by B is greater than four, then basically we call that one deep foundation. So pile is basically a part of the deep foundation. You can see here that these are tall buildings, two tall buildings here. This is the ground level here. You cannot see anything below here because this is in the subsurface. But you can see there are a lot of slender columns that's actually taking the load and transfer that load from here to a deep layer which is much stronger than the shallow layers here. Now let's move forward and let's see what is basically our power pile foundation is. So pile foundation is a type of deep foundation is actually a slender column or long cylinder made of material such as concrete, steel or timber which are used to support the structure and transfer the load to a desired depth. The deep foundation is defined as when the depth is significantly larger than the width of the foundation. As I said earlier, that DF by B has to be at least four for deep foundation. And then pile foundations are usually used for large structures or heavy structures when the nearby soil layer is not capable to handle that kind of load. So you have to transfer that load to a suitable depth where the soil strength is significantly higher. So when we use pile foundation, what are the situations, you know, like we usually use by pile foundations. So First of all, when the soil at shallow depth is weak and compressible, when the structure needs to carry lateral loads, when the structure will be constructed in a expansive or collapsible soil, when the structure needs to resist uplift force, like many um, uh, towers, when the soil requires compaction to a deeper depth, when there is a possibility of scouring, uh, usually for uh, bridge piers uh, inside a river, okay? When the groundwater table is high and when it is impossible to keep the foundation trenches dry by pumping or taking any other measures due to heavy inflow of seepage. Now let's see the classification of uh, pile types. So pile foundation can be classified based on function or use. And that would be three like sheet pile, load bearing pile and soil compactor piles. And then load bearing piles could be end bearing piles or friction piles. Similarly, we can classify that one based on the material we use for the piles. And these are usually four different types, steel pile, concrete pile, timber piles, and composite piles. And each of them can be classified as uh, two different types. First of all, for steel pipes, you can see that could be I section piles or hollow pipes, concrete piles could be two different precast piles and cast in place piles. 
timber piles that could be untreated timber piles and chemically treated piles. And then composite piles with timber, with precast concrete or steel and cast in situ concrete. Okay. Now we are going to, you know, kind of get familiar with each type of um, piles before we go to the design part. Okay. So first let's start with uh, sheet piles. So sheet piles, this type of piles is mostly used to provide lateral support. You can see here, this is the picture here, sheet piles, okay? So usually there is this, you know, like lateral pressure from loose soils, the flow of water, etc. cetera. Sheet piles serve as the following purposes here. So construction of retaining walls, protection from the river bank erosion, you can see here, retain the loose soil around foundation trenches for isolation of foundation from adjacent soils. And then finally, for confinement of soil and thus increase the bearing capacity of the soil. Okay, now let's move forward to uh, load bearing piles. Load bearing piles can be two different types. First of all, what is load bearing piles? This type of piles usually transfer the vertical load from a shallow depth to a higher depth. Okay, now the, it could be like either end bearing piles or friction piles or both. Okay, so what is end bearing piles? If you just put that one, this is your soft soil and try to take the load from here to a hard strata here. And you can see the load here, Q is completely taken by the end bearing capacity. Okay, so there is no friction here. So that's called the end bearing piles. On the other hand, you have friction piles it doesn't have any end bearing pile because there is no hard strata here or the hard strata is far away from the soil surface. So you cannot go that far for, or you don't need to go that far. In that situation, only the friction that create, that develop between the pile and the soil that will take a lot of loads and may be adequate for your design, okay? But at the same time, most of the cases, the load bearing piles, they will carry this end bearing capacity or tip resistance as well as your frictional resistance. Okay, we'll see that one when we move further. So soil compactor piles. Sometimes piles are driven to place closely intervals to increase the bearing capacity of the soil by compaction. Okay, so you can see these are high displacement piles, usually timber piles, and they're solid. So when you try to, you know, push them, they will displace the soil and try to make the soil very dense in between here. Okay, so some compactor piles are usually short and the length depends on how you know, far you want to go to make your soil compaction. And soil compaction depends on the pile diameter as well as the space between piles. As I said, like if the pile diameter is bigger, this means like the displacement of soil would be bigger. And the same way when the uh, pile spacing is closure, this means like the soil will be more dense. Okay, now let's move forward. Piles materials. You can see different type of pile materials can be used in practice. And that depends on basically the type of load to be carried, subsoil conditions, location of the water table and installation technique required. But the, the type of material we usually use here. The most common types are used for piles are steel piles, com concrete piles, 
timber piles and composite piles. Okay, now, as I said here, that if the load is too high, then basically we usually use steel pile. If the load is not that high, then basically we can use concrete or timber piles, something like that, okay? And some cases we use composite piles because like you understand that we don't want to put like steel pile under the water because there's a lot, there could be a lot of corrosion there. So in the water part, we can put some concrete piles and on top of that, we can just add some steel piles there. So to minimize the corrosion, okay? Now let's try to see all these four materials one by one. Uh, so first of all is steel piles. Steel piles could be either pipe piles or rolled, H, rolled steel H section piles. This is H section piles. You can see here cross section looks like H and these are pipes, okay? These are pipes, these are H section piles. Now, Pipe piles can be driven into the ground with their end open or closed. I just tried to show that one here is open, 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 and this one is closed. When this one is closed, then basically we call that one high displacement pile so that they can displace the soil. On the other hand, when you use that open end, this means like they will just go through the soil and it doesn't displace soil that much, okay? Now, H section piles are usually preferred over white flange and I section steel beams because their wave and flange thickness are equal. So they can actually displace equal amount of soil. In many cases, the pipe piles are filled with concrete after they have been driven, causing them to become composite piles. So you push the pipe, and then fill that one with concrete, okay? Now, steel pile, what are the general fact um, about the steel piles? First of all, you can see usually they are 15 meter to 60 meter long. Their usual load carrying capacity is 300 kilonewton to 1200 kilonewton. Okay, very strong. What are the advantages? First of all, easy to handle with respect to cutoff and extension to the desired length. Can stand high driving stress when you are just trying to drive with like your piston and you know like a hammer, then basically it can resist high driving stress. Can penetrate hard layers such as dense gravel or soft rock and high load carrying capacity. What are the disadvantages? First of all, relatively expensive, high level of noise, noise when you try to drive that one into the soil and definitely subject to corrosion because this is steel and H file may be damaged or deflect from the vertical uh, driving through hard layers like rocks and everything. Okay, so that's one of the disadvantage for your steel piles. Now concrete piles. So they are basically two categories. One is like precast piles and cast in situ piles. This is precast pile here and you can see this is cast in situ pile. So the difference is like you just pick us that one somewhere, then bring to the side and try to drive with your machine, driving machine. Here, actually, you make a hole first in the ground. Then sometimes you use casing. Sometimes you don't use casing, but you fill that one with reinforcement and then fill that one with concrete, okay? So the fact about, uh, Concrete piles. So usual length is 10 meter to 15 meter. Usual load is 300 kilonewton to 3000 kilonewton. 
what are the advantages? They can be subjected to hard driving, very strong corrosion resistance. That's one of the most important part for concrete when you compare that one with the steel. Can be easily combined with a concrete superstructures. Easier, okay, to connect concrete to concrete. And what are the disadvantages? Difficult to achieve pro proper cutoff and difficult to transport from one place to another place if this is like your precast pile. Pre-stressed, precast concrete pile, which is as actually getting popularity you know, these days because precast pile can be uh, added with like high strength steel uh, cables so that the, you know, like the strength of the piles is very high. The ultimate strength of the cables is about like 1800 mega Newton per meter square during casting of the pile, the cables are pre-tensioned to about 900 to 1300 um, millinewton per meter square and the concrete is poured around them. After curing, the cables are cut, produced a compressive force on the pile section. These are the sections here, okay? So you can just take that one at your side and drive that one with pile driving equipments. So what about the general facts about precast uh, piles? First of all, usual length is uh, 10 meter to 45 meters. Maximum length is 60 meter. And maximum load is uh, 7,500 kilonewton to 8,500 kilonewton, okay? Now, cast in situ concrete pile. As I said earlier, that for cast in situ pile, you usually make a hole in the ground first. Um, there are various type of um, types currently used for construction. Most of them have been uh, patented by their manufacturers, divided into two broad categories, cased and uncased. Okay, both types have a pedestal at the bottom. These are different types of, you know, like cast in situ concrete piles. Okay, different shape and different types here. So first of all, you have to make a hole in the ground. Then many cases, if the soil is soft, you cannot hold that hole. You know, that's why you need a casing there. So yes, as soon as you go down for your boring, you use a casing and you go down with that, okay? Then once the hole is ready, then you put the reinforcement there and fill that one with concrete and take the casing out from there. If it is uncased, many case, many times you can leave the case there, but that would be relatively expensive, right? So cased cast in situ concrete piles. So cased piles are made by driving a steel casing into the ground using a mandrel placed inside the casing, something like this, okay? When the pile reached the proper depth, the mandrel is withdrawn and the casing is filled with concrete. Most of the time, actually, we fill that one with the reinforcement and then fill with the concrete, right? So the fact about cased, you know, cast in place piles, they are usually 15 to 50 feet, feet long. Maximum length is 100 feet to 130 feet. Usual load is 45 keep to 115 keep. And approximately maximum load is 180 keeps. What are the advantage of this type? Relatively cheap. Allow for inspection before pouring concrete. You just want to see the hole is there and uh, things are 
uh, since you are using casing, so there is no chance that the side wall will cave in and make the concrete, you know, like fill with actually soil. And easy to explain. What are the disadvantages of that? That's difficult to splice after concreting. And then casting may be damaged during driving. That's the two advantages you can get most of the time. Uncased cast in situ concrete piles. These are actually very similar to the cased piles. Only difference is here. The casing is then gradually withdrawn. When you put the concrete at the same time, you are taking your casing out from there. Okay. So what is the fact about uncased cast in piles? Usual length is 15 to 50 feet. Maximum length is 100 feet to 130 feet. Usual load is 67 to 115 kip. And approximate maximum load is 160 kips. What the advantage of that? This is economical and can be finished at any elevation. Disadvantage? difficult to splice after concrete. Actually, you have to break a little bit of concrete if you want to splice and then uh, make the reinforcement, you know, the splicing and then add the concrete again. Void may be created if com concrete is placed rapidly. And the soil, subsoil, the side of the hole may cave in. That's the biggest problem actually with like uncased pipes that many times the side of the wall will cave in and what will happen like the concrete will be filled with some soil and maybe um, not achieve enough strength to uh, hold the load okay timber piles very common in construction and uh, these are actually trunks of the tree that have like branches, barks, carefully trimmed off. To qualify for use as a pile, the timber should be straight, sounded without any defect. Fact about timber piles. The maximum length of the most timber piles is from 30 to 65 feet. Okay, timber piles cannot withstand hard driving stress. Therefore, the pile capacity is generally limited. So when you try to push that one with your machine or put the hammer down there, then basically the, you know, like the part you know, on the top of the uh, pile will be damaged. That's the first thing. Second thing, if you see there is any hard layer or any gravel at the bottom, then it's again the problem. Timber piles can stay undamaged indefinitely if they are surrounded by saturated soil, okay? So usually there is saturated soil, there is no chance that the insect will you know, attack the uh, wooden pile. But we can see when this one is like above the water table, these piles are subjected to attack by insects. We also see that marine environment Actually, here, marine environment, timber piles are subjected to attack by various organisms and that can be damaged extensively in the few months. And once again, you can improve the life of the you know, timber piles some, by using some preservatives such as creosote that will try to prevent the insect to attack the timber piles, okay? Now there are three different classes of timber piles depend on like what type of wood we are talking about and how much load they can take. So this is class one piles which can carry heavy loads. The bud diameter should be minimum 14 inch. Class B piles where bud diameter would be 12 to 13 and class C piles which is mostly used for temporary construction work. Uh, and here is the 
uh, strain properties of timber, pro you know, piles. You can see these are southern pines, Douglas fir, large pole pine, road, uh, red oaks, and red pine. We see, like, based on the axial compression, bending shear compression perpendicular to the grain and like modulus of elasticity, actually Douglas feed, this is kind of the best pile you can have from the timbers, okay? Composite piles. So upper and lower portion of the composite piles are made of different materials. Here, you can see the bottom part here is actually concrete and the top part is steel. So if you want to put a little bit of the pile under the water or the saturated zone, then basically you can use that one there and then use the top part above the water table, okay? Steel and concrete piles also, this is the steel and concrete piles. And sometimes we also do like you can see concrete and wooden piles actually, okay? Uh, forming proper joints between two dissimilar material is sometimes very, very difficult. We understand that, but these are not like widely used. These days, actually, we can see there are different type of, you know, like uh, composite material they're using to make the piles. You can see here, this is a steel pipe, but outside of that pile is recycled plastic that some of the steel core pile, pile. Then you can see here, these are recycled plastic metrics rather than using concrete, they're using recycled plastic material. So you can see this is FRP shell, fiberglass, and then this one is filled with concrete infill. So these are special material from manufacturers and they have the details uh, and the uh, detailed property of that material with them and they will provide you like what kind of strength these piles have, okay? Now, method of pile installation. How do we install pile? There are basically two different methods. First of all, uh, driving piles. You can see here, this is your pile. This is the driving head or piston, sometimes we call that one hammer too. So this one will just drop like this, drop like this and try to push that one. That's the drive-in piles. So drive-in piles, we usually try to displace the soil. And the second one is board piles. Here is the boring you know, thing. You are using this one, making a board first, making a hole first, then you are just putting that reinforcement down here and then you are filling with concrete very slowly, okay? So this is your board piles. Now, what are the fact about pile installations? Most piles are driven into ground using a pile driving hammer. There are several types of hammer. You will just take a look in your book and read that one once and you'll understand that how you can just drive your hammer um, into your pile to push that one inside the soil. Jetting is sometimes required to penetrate through a thin layer or of hard soil, okay? Jetting of water, actually. You are using high pressure water to cut the bottom so that you, your pile can go through that very easily. So pile, Driving causes displacement of soil, whereas board piles do not displace any soil. Uh, and you can see cast in, pile, cast in place concrete pile are installed by placing an enforcement cage into a board hole and the ground and pour fresh concrete into the hole. Okay. Now, load transfer mechanism how the pile will transfer the load from the structure to the soil, okay? So in that picture, you can see at here is your subsurface, you know, surface of the ground level here, you are trying to add some 
load here, okay? Uh, let's say this is Q equal to Z equal to zero. So at surface, you are applying the load and then increase that load gradually. So a part of that load will be resisted by the side friction developed along the shaft and a part will be uh, taken by the tip of the pile. So here, so this is your side friction all along the pile here, and this is the tip resistance, okay? So you can see if your total Q is from here to here, you can see a certain part would be taken care by the tip and certain part will be taken by the friction between the soil and the pile. And you can see this is Q1 here, okay? So this one Q is basically Q1 plus Q2. Now, the nature of the soil reaction looks like this, okay? The maximum frictional resistance Q1 is equal to QS. Here, Q1 equal to QS, ultimate situation here, will be fully mobilized when the relative displacement between the soil and the pipe is about 0.2 to 0.3 inch. Okay, then we'll get the maximum possible friction there. Similarly, the maximum point resistance or the resistance at the tip, we sometimes call point resistance, sometimes we call that one tip resistance, okay? So that would be maximum when the pile tip has moved 10 to 25% of the pile width. So you can see this is much smaller, 0.2 to 0.3 inch than 10 to 25% of the pile width. So this one is basically saying that the skin friction QS is developed at much smaller pile displacement compared to the point resistance QP. So you can see Actually, this is that the final case, like when this is your QU, then basically you will see this one is your deep resistance. And from here to here, that would be actually your friction resistance, okay? Now we have different method, how to calculate this deep resistance and how to find out the frictional resistance. Definitely we'll be talk about that in the later section. the equation for estimating the pile capacity. So you can see the load carrying capacity QU of a pile that can be given with this equation here. So QU equal to QP plus QS, where QP is the load carrying capacity of the pile tip, and Q is the frictional resistance or skin friction derived from the pile and soil interface. Okay, so that's basically two components here, QP and QS. So now you can remember for some of the cases, QS is zero. You have only Q equal to QP, we call that one end bearing piles, what I talked already, okay? And some cases QP equal to zero, we just try to, because here doesn't have a strong layer, but the soil here that cause significant amount of friction resistance. So in that situation, this one is zero. So your Q you would be QS. So we call that one friction piles. Okay, one is uh, end bearing piles. The other, other one is friction piles, okay? But most of the cases you will see, both of them actually will be working. Point bearing capacity, how can we find out the point bearing capacity? That's actually very similar to our shallow foundation, QE for our shallow foundation. You can see C prime and C Q prime and Q star and gamma B and gamma star. We don't have the shape depth and inclination factor here because they are already included here, 
okay? They are already included in that shape and depth factor here. And most of the cases, these are axial load that you are trying to um, put through the piles. So your inclination is always along the main axis of the pile, okay? So now let's, if you try to, you know, like simplify that one little bit, you can see here that the B of the pile is very small compared to the length, okay? So you can ignore that one. So your Q U equal to C prime N C star plus Q prime N Q star. Now the total resistance would be Q P into A P. So point bearing capacity of a pile is you are just trying that Q P, you are just multiplying that Q P with your area of the tip. So you just plug that value of this one here. So you're basically your point bearing capacity would be A P C prime N C star plus Q prime N Q star. Now we have to remember one more thing here that this is the size of the tip of the uh, piles. Now you can see most of the time, you know, like let's say this is a steel pile, a uh, pipe pile, steel pipe pile. You can see that when you are trying to drive that one, then soil plug will, will be here. And when we calculate the area, actually we calculate the whole area, including the soil because this soil will be stuck into that pile so strongly that most of the time we see that actually they behave like kind of like uh, similar material here. So same thing you can see here for H pile, even though the actual area of that pile is much smaller, but the soil plug will cause like the soil to stuck here. So usually we find out like the area here. So D1 multiplied by D2, that's the AP for this one. Okay, so area of steel plus soil plug, that's what we get from here. Okay. Now definitely we have several different methods, you know, like how we can find out this bearing capacity. But we'll, we'll be talking this one later on. So frictional resistance, QS, how we can find out the QS, okay? So you can see the frictional resistance or resistance of a pile for, or sometimes we call that one skin friction, which is QS is equal to summation of P, P is the perimeter of the pile, del L is the, because this one is working along the perimeter, okay? So you just try to see the total area, okay? The total area in the per perimeter. And this is the unit frictional resistance, means like the frictional resistance per unit area. So if you multiply it your perimeter with a certain length of the pile, then you get the area in the perimeter and then multiply that one with your F, that would give you the, actually the, skin friction or frictional resistance. Now you can see here that L is the increment pile length over which your perimeter and F are constant. So most of the time, like let's say for steel piles, uh, your uh, also like your precast piles, you know, like your P means like the perimeter is kind of constant. It doesn't change that much we usually see like for cast in place piles, actually your perimeter could change a little bit there. Okay, but for precast piles and steel piles, we see that most of the time the P remains same. So your F can change because based on like different soil layers. Okay, so here is one type of soil, have a length of L1, you have another type of soil here, and you have another type of soil here, okay? So the F is changing from here to here, and then from changing from here to here, and from here to here. So if I try to 
write that equation for three layer soils, that becomes something like that. Since the perimeter remains same, I'll keep that one P here, then L1, F1, this is my L1 and the fictional coefficient here is F1, here is F2 and here is F3. So your total QS would be P multiplied by L1, F1 plus L2, F2 plus L3, F3, okay? So F1, F2 and F3 are the fictional coefficient for layer one, two and three respectively, okay? So basically that summation thing that depends on how many layers you have. If you have five layers, then you have five different, you know, like components here, okay? That's the way you try to find out your fictional resistance. Now allowable bearing capacity. You see like at here, we actually try to find out QS and QP, which is actually your QU, but we don't want to, you know, like apply ultimate load to our piles. So use a factor of safety again. So your Q allowable would be Q ultimate divided by factor of safety, okay? And for factor of safety generally use range from two to three, depending on the uncertainty surrounding the calculation of ultimate load. So if you know the soil deposits is very uniform throughout the area at which you are trying to develop, then basically two would be enough. But if you see now your, uh, you know, like subsurface soil properties are changing, you know, from here to there, then basically it's always better to have a higher factor of safety. Let's here, you can use three, okay? Now determination of QP, how can you find out your QP? So first of all, the method to determine the point or tip resistance is different for sand and clay, okay? Two di different formulas, okay? The point resistance depend on the properties of the soil of the layer at which the tip resting. You can understand that if there is like, let's say, if I go back here, the tip resistance here, that actually the property of the soil in this layer, not here or here. On the other hand, the friction, frictional resistance that depends on like from here to here for this layer, from here to here for this layer, and here to here for this layer. But the tip resistance, once again, like the tip resistance depend only on the layer at which this one rests, okay? Now let's move forward there. The point resistance determined from different method, as I said, there are different methods there, but they can, you know, like differ significantly, okay? I will show you example that how much they can differ. Sometimes they can differ like 100% even. Okay, now if the soil layer at which this one is resting is a CP soil, as I said here, like this one is different for sand and clay, different method. So if you have like both sand and clay part of the soil, then what do you do? Then basically what we do, determine the point resistance separately once considering clay and then considering sand or considering sand and then clay and try to find out the QP for each of the cases. And once we get that one, then we just add them together to find out the total QP. So here you can see like for this particular soil, you can see this is C P soil so first of all, I will just consider this one as a sand and try to find out my QP for sand. Then I'll run the same analysis based on the clay. And this method is a little different. And then basically I'll find out my QP for clay. And the total capacity would be Q 
QP for sand plus QP for clay. Okay, so that's the, you know, like catch that you have to understand because the book didn't describe that one quite well. Okay. Now determination for QP for sand, Meyerhoff's method. Okay, so we have three methods here that we'll discuss uh, in this chapter. One is Meyerhoff's method, Vasics method, and Quell and Castillo method. Okay, so first of all, the Meyerhoff's method, you can see that the point bearing capacity of a pile in a sand generally increase with the depth of embedment in the bearing stratum and reaches the maximum value at an embedment ratio LB by D, LB which is equal to LB by D critical, okay? So it increases from zero and then at certain time it doesn't increase anymore because there is a limiting value. That's what we are talking about here so beyond the critical embedment ratio LB by DCR, the value of QP remains constant. Means like your QP is equal to your QL. L is the limiting factor, okay? So if I show that one here, then you can see this one is increasing, increasing, increasing. And when the depth is LB by CR, then basically this one doesn't increase anymore and remain safe, okay? So if your deep resistance for a pile in sand is QP is AP into QP. So here is your AP means the area of the tip and then Q prime is which is gamma H. If there is water, then you have to find out the effective stress and then NQ star, okay? But whatever QP you get from here, that has to be less than APQL. L is the limiting factor, like you cannot go more than that, okay? And the limiting point resistance is basically 0.5 PA NQ star 10 phi prime. PA is the atmospheric pressure, which is 100 kPa or 2000 PSF, and phi is the effective soil friction angle, okay? Now, how can you find out your NQ star? So that's basically, if you, if you know your friction angle, phi prime, then basically you can either get that one, your NQ star from this chart or from this table, okay? If you know the friction angle here, let's say 24, then your NQ star has to be 24, that has to be 21.4, okay? So it's not that difficult. Only thing you have to remember that your QP, you can find out this equation, but that has to be less than or equal to your limiting factor here. So once you get your NQ star, you can just find out this one, you can just find out this one, and then basically you choose the lower of the two, okay? That's basically your Meyerhoff's method. Now, Vasic's method is a little bit difficult because you have a lot of calculation there. For so basically the Vasic proposed method is getting that pile point bearing capacity based on the theory of expansion of cavities, okay? So according to his, you know, like theory, QP is equal to AP sigma prime bar, uh, sigma naught bar prime and N sigma star. But you have to first of all see that what is all those things here. So this one is basically one plus two K naught by three into Q prime. So K naught is the earth pressure coefficient at rest, which is one minus sine phi prime. N sigma star, that's the bearing capacity factor. And 
to find this out, you also need many other factors here. Like actually, according to Visic, your N sigma star is a function of your reduced rigidity index of soil. Now, how do you find out this IRR? Once you get your IRR, then basically from the table, you can find out your N sigma star. If you get your N sigma star and find out this one from one plus two K naught, which is actually one minus sine phi divided by three into Q prime, then basically plug that one in this equation and you can find out your QP. Now, how can I find out my IRR? That's the question here. Now you can see here, actually your reduced rigidity index IRR is actually IR divided one plus IR into delta, where IR is rigidity index, IRR is a reduced rigidity index. You use that one um, in, um, in chapter six, where you have been uh, working on shallow foundation, okay? So your rigidity index is equal to ES divided by two into mu S Q prime tan phi prime, or you can use GS divided by Q prime tan phi prime. While ES is the modulus of elasticity of soil, mu S is the Poisson's ratio, GS is the shear modulus of elasticity for soil, and delta is average volumetric strain in the plastic zone below the pile point, okay? Now, how can I get all those values for soil? So he gave you some of the information here. So according to Chen and Kulwe, your ES is equal to MPA. PA is the atmospheric pressure. You already know 100 kPr, 2000 PSF. And M is basically 100 to 200 for loose soil. 200 to 500 for medium dense soil and 500 to 1000 for dense soil. So usually you can, for loose soil, you can let's say 100 to 200 most of the time, we'll just pick the middle of the two, average of the two, so 150, okay? Then so what is our Poisson's ratio of the soil? That's x mu S is equal to 0.1 plus 0.3 phi prime minus 25 divided by 20 if your P prime is varies from 25 to 45, okay? And then average volumetric strain that delta is 0 0.005 into P prime minus 25 by 20 into Q prime by P A prime. Since you know your P A prime, you can find out your Q prime very easily, which is gamma H, right? and then gamma submerged into H. I will say this way because this is effective stress. And if you, your phi is given, then you can see like you can find out delta and MS quite easily. If you know what type of soil here, then basically you can find out your ES from there. Once you find out your ES, then you can just plug that one here you can find out your IR. Once you get your IR, you can find out your IRR. As soon as you get your IRR, then basically you can use the table here to find out your N sigma star, okay? So this is your IRR, this is your phi. So if you see your phi is 25 and RR is 80, then basically you can just go there. If you see your IRR equal to 90, then basically you have to interpolate from these two values to find out what would be your value for 90, okay? Once you get that, your N sigma star, then just plug that one in the equation and find out your uh, tip resistance, okay? Let's move forward. This is the quail and castio method. This is actually a very simple method, okay? So quail and castio actually analyzed 24 large field scale tests on drive and pile and suggested that the key resistance QP in sand has to be Q prime 
into nq star into ap. Okay, now nq star is a function of your phi prime and L by D ratio, okay? So this is your L by D ratio. This is basically your phi here. And then you know, this is your phi here actually for different lines. So from there, you just find out what would be your NQ star here, okay? So let's say your L is 10 and let's say L is 30 and D equal to one. So L by D equal to one and your phi equal to 30. So you just go to this line and then go here to find out what would be your bearing capacity NQ star, which is actually here almost like 25, okay? So this one is kind of easy. So these are the three cases to find out the deep resistance for sand, okay? For sand, you have three different methods. One is your Meyerhoff's method, then Vasic's method, and Coil and Castio method. Now let's see that what happens like when my tip of the pile is on the clay, okay, pure clay. Now one more thing, I forgot that one, like, uh, this is the correlation for QP with SPT numbers. If you know your SPT or N numbers, what is SPT? That's standard penetration number, right? If you know that penetration number, you can calculate your QP from there for granular soil, for sand, okay? So there is two different equation here. One is given by Meyerhoff. So your QP is 0.4 PA N60, N60 is your SPD value, the L divided by D, and this one must have to less than 4 PA N60. Okay, this is the limiting value. It cannot go higher than that, okay? It should be less or equal to this value. And again, Dr. Bude also give you another equation and he is saying your QP equal to 19.7 PA N60 to the power 0.36, okay? So this N60 is also your, your, your SPT value, okay? Now for clay, determination of QP for clay. So Meyerhoff's method, very easy. He is saying that your QP is NCCUAP, but for saturated clay, your NC is nine. So this one is actually nine CUAP, okay? So your QP is nine CUAP. So CU is the undrained cohesion of the clay soil and AP is the area of the tip of the pile. But this is very careful that this is saturated clay, must have to be below the water table, okay? Now, if you have C phi soil, then you have to use this equation and the other Meyerhoff's equation for sand, find out your QP separately and then add them together to find out your total QP, okay? And so once again, I tried to show that one here that your AP is basically the whole area here, even though this is a you know, hole here, but soil plug will be there. So the area is actually the whole area here. Your area is actually D1 into D2. You don't subtract that area because there is no steel there, but you have soil plug there. Soil is kind of stuck there. So basically you have to consider the whole thing as the area of the tip, okay? Now let's see like Vasic's method. Vasic's method is saying for saturated clay, actually that would be clay, saturated clay, which is QP is equal to APQP, which is APCUNC star, where CU is undrained cohesion. You can see like for Meyerhoff's equation, this one was nine, but now it's you can have to find that out. So your NC star is four by three ln 
i r r plus one plus pi by two plus one. Okay, so you have to find that out from that equation here. Okay, now for saturated clay, there is some you know modification here. So no volume change occurs. So delta is equal to zero. So your I R R is equal to I R. That's the simplification. So you can find out your I R is equal to E S divided by three C U. Okay. So your I R R is equal to E S divided by three C U. Once you get that value, you just plug that one here and you can find out your N C star here. You will see this value is very close to actually nine. It can vary from like five to you know like fifteen, but most of the cases this value is very close to nine. Okay. So here is your N C star value. Either you can use this equation, or there is already you know if you know your I R R, plug that one here, and you can find out your N C from this table. Okay, or use this equation whichever you feel more comfortable. O'Neill and Risi, they also suggested that you can find out your IR, which is also equal to IRR for P equal to zero soil is 347 into CU by PA minus 33 and has to be less than 300. Okay, so you can see for 300, you get your NC star is actually 11.51, okay? Now let's see an example here, okay? So that you can understand that what we are trying to do here, okay? So this one is saying that consider a 15 meter long concrete pile with a cross section of 0.45 meter into 0.45 meter, fully embedded in sand. Okay, it's a sand case. For the sand, given unit weight, dama equal to 17 kilonewton per meter cube, and the soil friction angle phi prime is 35 degrees. Estimate the ultimate point bearing capacity following Meerhaupt's method, basics method, coil and Castillo method, and then saying that after finding the value of all three methods, then find out like you recommend, like what would be the value of your QP, okay? Now let's say solution for Meerhoff's method, okay, A. So you can see for Meerhoff's method, we know your QP is equal to AP Q prime NQ star and should be less than AP into 0.5 PA NQ star 10 phi prime. Since our phi prime is 35, the value of NQ star from the table is 143. And your Q prime is gamma H, which is 17 into 15. So this is 255 kilonewton per meter squared. They didn't tell anything about the water table. So basically we are just assuming that there is no water there, okay? So thus, this part here, AP Q prime NQ is equal to 0.45 into 0.45 square size, and then 255 into 143, which is your NQ star. So that's 7,384 kilonewton. But there is a limiting value all the time for, you know, like for Meerhaupt's method. So you can see this is your limiting value. So AP 0.5 PA NQ star 10 phi prime. If you try to find that out, you just get 1014 kilonewton. So basically we have to pick the lower of the two. So actually your QP is 1014 kilonewton, okay? Now let's try to see basics method. If I do the same problem, then what, how much I get from basics method? So according to basic, your QP is AP sigma not prime, uh, then this one and N sigma prime, okay? So first of all, you find out this value here, which is actually one plus two K naught, 
which is one minus sine p divided by three into q prime. We already know our q prime is 17 into 15. So I plug all those values and I get this one is equal to 139.96 kilonewton per meter square. Now we have to find out our ES, which is equal to PA into M. So for medium clay, medium sand, that's what we are assuming here actually, okay? Um, so my M is 250. Um, I'm just assuming that one. You know that the table gave you the M value for different type of soil, loose soil, medium soil, and uh, a dense soil. So M is 250, so your ES has to be 25,000 kilonewton per meter square. Your mu S means like your Poisson's ratio is 0.1 plus 0.3 phi minus 25 by 20. That's actually 0.25. You find out your deformation and you get that one 0 0.0064. Then you plug that one in your IR equation and your IR is 56, then you find out your IRR. So this one is basically 41.2. Now from the table, you just try to see your phi prime is 35 and your IRR is 41.2. The value of N sigma star is 55. Hence, your QP, you just plug that value here and you get like 1,559 kilonewton, okay? So little difference here, that 1,014 and here is 1,559, almost like 50% different, I would just say. Now, if we do that one based on Coil and Castillo method, then basically you can see QP is equal to Q prime NQ star AP. We try to find out our L by D, which is 15 is the length, 0.45 is the diameter. So L by D is 33.3. And for phi equal to 35, LD equal to 33, the value of NQ star is about 48, okay? So your QP is almost like 2479, okay? Now you can see this one is actually 250 times, 250% higher than the first one, right? Almost 200, 250% uh, higher or 2.5 times higher here. So when you see that one of them is too high compared to the other two, so what they did they took the lowest two and get the average of that. And they are saying like, let's use QP equal to 1250 kilonewton. Once again, you know, like the, how the interaction of the pile and the soil is actually still unknown. There is no like solid equation that we can use because most of the time when you use piles, we don't know what's going on you know, under the soil. So they are might have like that they there might have like a lot of different equations that this book included only three of the methods. But actually, if you see the literature, there has like many others equation there too. At least like 10 to 12 different equations have, have been proposed so far. But the author actually picked the most reliable one, but you can still see the difference is very, very high. Okay, but if you follow any um, any method that has been you know included in your book and do your design, and anything happens later on, then basically you are not responsible for that because you followed or you just show the correct reference. Okay, so you can see this type of thing will happen in all other problems. What I'll, I'll talk about. Um, in the pile, ch piles ch foundation chapters, okay? So anyway, so I'll stop it here and thank you for your attention.